Riding at home with ABOR's housing economist, Claire Losey. All right, guys, we're here with another episode of Driving at Home with Dr. Claire Losey. Claire, how are you doing on a cooler than expected Monday morning? <laughs> really enjoying the weather. How are same. you? I, same, same. And while it's cool here, apparently the economy is not. <laughs> so No, things are running relatively hot, so to speak. A little hot. So tell us about the CPI numbers. Again, those are the Consumer Price Index, which is at global metric for inflation overall. What did we see in the report that came out at the end of last week? Consumer inflation continues to run a little bit hotter than expected, still decelerating relative to the upwards of 10% year-over-year consumer price growth that we saw at the height of our inflationary cycle right in June of 2022. So in September of this year, the CPI came in at 3.7% year-over-year and 0.4% month-over-month. Core inflation, which strips out the more volatile categories of food and energy, measured 4.1% year-over-year and 0.3% month-over-month. So again, overall, things are still cooling, but not quite as quickly as we otherwise would have hoped which is generally not ideal in terms of the Fed heading into their meetings to discuss the interest rates again. It's particularly not ideal in the context of several other factors. Of course, the labor market is still running fairly hot. We're still seeing the ratio, for example, of job openings to unemployed workers hovering around two. Historically, it's a little bit closer to one or at least below 1.5. Meanwhile, we've got mounting geopolitical tensions right in the Middle East. And then, of course, just still concerns about the Fed's ability to navigate this inflationary cycle and to achieve that soft landing. So that's all combining to continue to push those 10-year Treasury yields up. And what we're seeing now is that investors are actually indicating that they don't think the Federal Reserve is going to hike rates in its November meeting and actually is anticipating that they won't hike rates either in December. There's a 90 percent probability being priced into the market that the Fed will not hike in November and a 67 percent probability that the Fed will not hike in December. And of course, those odds are subject to change as the data evolves. But of course, last week was such a big week with the data moving into our November meeting. It seems like the Fed's just in a bit of a conundrum, too. They're working to stabilize an economy that is strong in the sense that there are two jobs for every one people and that pay is keeping up, generally speaking, with the increased cost of goods and increased cost of living. But they're working to try to bring all of that down at the same time by leveraging the tool of rates, which is then creating more expense and more cost of living. It just seems like we're on a gerbil wheel. And even from within our own industry, we saw last week NAR, the National Association of Home Builders and the Mortgage Bankers Association, in a combined statement to the Fed, call on them to provide market certainty about its rate path so that the mortgage market will calm or ease a bit. Although we understand that there are many complex factors that lead to increases in mortgage rates, it seems sort of like they're in an unprecedented place, that they're doing their best to use the tools at their disposal to manage the economy, but it continues to sort of roar on. Is that a fair assessment? That's absolutely fair. And just to draw back to your point about the different industry groups and their policy statement, so the Federal Reserve relies heavily, particularly has relied heavily over the past decade plus now on something called forward guidance, which means that they want to provide very clear indication now as to what they are going to do in the near term. So, for example, they want to provide, after the September meeting and in his press conference during that September meeting, Chair Powell provided forward guidance or provided indication about the Fed's rate direction come November, come their November meeting. And we continue to see that guidance coming out as the different Fed presidents, you know, the presidents of the different Federal Reserve banks make their various speeches, whatnot, leading up to the November meeting. But essentially what these different industry groups are saying is we are also now accustomed to relying on forward guidance 
right? And markets have grown accustomed to that. And what we're seeing now is there's some mixed signals. So if you look at the summary of economic projections that the Fed published after its September meeting, the odds of them hiking rates in November or December were very high. The majority of participants, FOMC participants, indicated that they thought that they would need to raise rates in order to achieve their 2% inflation objective, in order to move towards that objective. But now we're seeing them walk that back a little bit, right? We're seeing that they're generally providing indication that they think higher rates, for example, in the treasury market, you know, a higher 10-year T yield is in a way a substitute for them hiking rates themselves. What I'm trying to say is there's just this back and forth movement. What's the ta- right? It's the tail wagging the dog. Which one's the leader? And exactly. I think what we're seeing we're getting at least, a little confused. Yeah. And, and in terms of what our industry advocates, you know, advocacy and government affairs being a significant component of what we do as an association, same at that national level, what NAR is saying is the Fed ought to be the leader in the that. Leader. The Fed yeah. ought to clearly state, and, and they very explicitly asked Fed chairman to say, you are not going to raise rates or you are going to raise rates and it is what it is, but hopefully not going to raise rates and to be explicit about that so that the 10 year treasury yield will calm itself to some degree, at least on the front that is impacted by what the Fed projects. Because we have to remember that mortgage rates today are very much impacted by the market's prediction of what the Fed is going to do several weeks from now in its November meeting. And I think just as an association, that's important work for us to look to our federal advocates to call boldly on the Fed to make decisions that provide stability for the marketplace and an understanding for future and current homeowners about what they should expect from the mortgage market as well. Were there any nuances in the consumer price index that pertain to like specific industries inflation or what we saw in terms of the cost of shelter versus some of the other spread across the report? So generally what we're seeing is that increases in rent, so increases in shelter costs continue to push the consumer price index higher, continue to inflate it, so to speak. But there are a lot of issues embedded in the methodology that captures that rent number, that increase in rental costs that we have seen. And there's been a push to move towards a different methodology or a different measure because as of right now, the measure that's being used really is reflective of conditions many months ago, even upwards of a year ago. It's not necessarily reflective of current market rents. Obviously, we want it to be commensurate with the other measures of inflation, which are more or less measuring real-time changes in the particular underlying item or good you, you know, service that they're measuring. So. Especially given the effects of the work that they do as they measure this report directly impact mortgage rates, which, which obviously then in turn directly impact rental rates to some degree as well. We know there to be more volatility in that than several months ago worth of data. Right. That makes sense. Well, what are we seeing in the housing market this week? What we were kind of weird last week because it was close to month end. And now what are we seeing week over week? So sales continued to slow last week down about 14% in the MSA and down even more about 27% within the city of Austin itself. Fairly flat with respect to active listings and new listings. And there was actually a significant percentage of properties withdrawn from the market, about 26%, an uptick in that. On the leasing front, closed leases remain relatively flat, as did active listings. And new listings were actually down about 16%. So overall, what we're seeing is that certainly... Sellers are more hesitant to enter the market and buyers are facing, in a lot of ways, fewer options in the sense that while there is more inventory on the market right now, their affordability has been constrained by higher rates. So depending on what they can afford, there's potentially actually less selection available to them just because of our 
continued constraints within the Austin MSA with respect to that affordable stock of homes, that affordable inventory of homes. Do we have any statistics or insight into the numbers around those that were withdrawn? What's the lag time in terms of how long they've been sitting or the number of price adjustments that are associated with those on average? Or is it, you know, really people just feeling reactive to an understanding that buyers buying power has shifted? We don't necessarily have hard data. I think it is reflective of mortgage rates topping 7.5%. Last week, of course, coming in at 7.57%. That 7.5%, that's a threshold in buyers' and sellers' minds. Even though we know that there's not going to be a significant difference between a mortgage rate of 7.47% and 7.57%, there's still kind of that mental... It's fear. It's reactive to, well, who can buy this house now at this point, given the headline around the mortgage rate? In fear that rates could rise, mortgage rates could rise to 8%. So topping that 7.5% is going to spike. And so the kind of the interesting dynamic of that is if we see shrinking inventory and we recognize that the demand still outpaces the inventory that we have and has for essentially over 10 years, that despite the the high interest rates, you know, you have people willing and ready to buy, we're shrinking the inventory that's going to put pressure on price at a time that things are already unaffordable and largely inaccessible given the interest rates. We would see a vastly different market if we had a higher supply, if we had more supply of those affordably priced homes. So under $300,000 is really what I'm talking about. Yeah. We would see much different conditions in the market. And I suspect, are the withdrawals within a certain segment of the market in terms of price right. class? Yes. Higher price properties. Yeah. Yeah. We've seen a, a shift as we've talked about in the sense that sales activity among higher price properties, particularly homes priced really $600,000 and above, you know, are that their sales activity is declining. Okay, well, I think next week maybe we'll dig into some of those withdrawn numbers a little bit and kind of dig into a market issue that we're seeing kind of start now and want to watch and monitor through the fall. And then we'll continue just to report, you know, overall on the economy as well. But the other thing we have happening this week is that stats are coming out tomorrow when this releases. You want to give us a little preview of kind of what our overall month end stats are saying. Absolutely. So we saw a moderation in sales down 18%. The median sales price was more or less sticky, down about 4%. Both of those figures are year over year. And really happening within the market right now is that there's upward pressure on prices because there's not a sufficient supply of affordable inventory. So while sales are moderating, that's part and parcel of the fact that we don't have that affordable inventory of homes. We know that anytime the mortgage rate increases, home buyers' potential purchasing power declines. So that's going to raise demand for those more affordable homes in a higher rate environment. So we're seeing that because The supply of homes is still not commensurate with demand. Months of inventory hovered around four in September. But because the supply of homes is still not commensurate with demand, that means that we're still seeing that upward pressure on prices. And that's why we're starting to see, we have seen a deceleration in the rate of decline in our median sales price for several months now. So we've gone from a year-over-year price decline of upwards of 15% throughout our MSA earlier this year to now hovering around 4%. Which it's reasonable given the dynamics of what we're seeing in terms of buying power overall. Yeah, we've seen obviously a near doubling, almost even tripling of rates over the past year and a half now, and that significantly impacts a potential buyer's purchasing power, like you said. And again in September, we saw that fewer than 10% of homes sold were priced below $300,000. So again, pointing to that upward pressure on the median sales price. Great. Got it. And Claire, just a reminder to our membership that you're going to start holding office hours so that if they want to dig into some specific area of the market or a specific understanding of any of the topics that we're taking on as well, when and where can they reach you and how can they come hang out? 
So we are going to push office hours to next week so that we can unpack the monthly housing stats that are coming out as of today, the release of the podcast. So next Monday, which is the 23rd, I will be hanging out in the member lounge from two to four and feel free to Abor headquarters. Yes. And feel free to come by and ask questions or give me feedback and we'll chat. Awesome. We would love that. Okay. Well, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for helping us continue to unpack a very complex kind of economic uh, environment right now. And thank you for helping guide our membership through this as well. Absolutely. Thanks guys. And take care. Talk soon.